Welcome to Funnel Reboot, the podcast that shares ideas on how to upgrade your lead generation. Here is your host, Glenn Schmeltzley. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot. Today, we're hearing what a longtime New York ad agency exec wants you to know about how to be a renegade. First, I want to thank you so much for listening to these marketing book author interviews. With the help of these authors, I'm holding a book giveaway. All you need to do for it is put out a post on Instagram or Twitter or on LinkedIn using the hashtag marketing books, one word. If you do that before the end of April, 2022, I'll be putting your name in a draw and I'll contact you after Saturday, April 30th to let you know that you've won. I'm going to keep giving away books until they're all gone. So your odds are really good. And I'd really love to get you a book as a way of saying thanks. Now to today's show. The author of the landmark book, Blue Ocean Strategy, W. Chan Kim, said, The hardest battle is simply to make people aware of the need for a strategic shift. He's not saying that our hardest job is the job, but our hardest job is to make people change what they want. I somehow feel he was thinking of marketers with this phrase. We marketers are changing the minds of our buyer so that they'll choose our brand. To do that, we're often changing our companies to produce the kind of value that our buyers expect. And as he said, changing that status quo, well, in some companies, it means overcoming a lot of lethargy. It takes someone who's courageous. Maybe as today's author would say, it takes a renegade. Today's author is the founder of the marketing agency, Renegade, and is the host of the podcast, Renegade Marketers Unite. He's been featured on network TV and many podcasts and writes a regular column for Ad Age. He joined me from his Manhattan office to talk about his second book, Renegade Marketing, 12 Steps to Building Unbeatable B2B Brands. And that book just came out in 2021. I want you to listen to this episode, get encouraged as a marketer, on how you can unleash your own inner renegade. Let's hear from Drew Neiser. I'm really glad to welcome Drew Neiser. Welcome to the show, Drew. Hey, Glenn. It is great to be here. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So we're here to talk about the book, Renegade Marketing. What's the full title? Renegade Marketing, 12 Steps to Building Unbeatable B2B Brands. Say that fast 12 times. <laughs> <laughs> well, thankfully, we don't have to. I could just pick up my copy of the book if I want to see yeah. it. Excellent. Um, so the book is uh, in it. It came out this year. Uh, well, we're now in 2022, but it came out in 2021, right? Correct. Yes. October. So, and I say that because, of course, it is important to timestamp these things. People uh, are aware that, you know, there had been a global pandemic and that we are um, in a new world in many ways and that books who can lean in and be attuned to that will probably be better for marketing going forward than those before. But yeah, you know, it's funny you say that because I had written what I thought was going to be this book and it was done February 2020. And then, but I was still editing it a little bit. And when the pandemic struck, uh, I actually put the book on hold for six months because I was, I wanted to be sure that the principles would still apply. And during that six months, I, I did two things. One, I took 45,000 words and I shortened it to 15,000 and put that up on our, I call it the mother of all blog posts. And if you go to renegade.com, you'll find a B2B strategy document. And that, it strips out a lot of the stories. It doesn't include the cat's metaphor, but it's a very good piece. And that gave me some sense of the validity of the overall structure. And then- Six months into it, it was clear to me that, you know, it was keep getting ammunition that supported it. So I, I essentially rewrote half of the book after the pandemic. 
but you know, all sorts of new case histories. And I went into it with a lot more confidence because I now knew that the principles would absolutely get you through it. A couple of the tactics, obviously we had to, we had to tweak. Yeah. And I think it's a very good point. Um, you could say it's going to be true in every direction you look, but I think particularly for CMOs, um, if we have taken a CMO and we look at a point in the business cycle when things are riding high, I'm sorry, but I don't think a, a CMO can point to specific things that they've done and say, well, see, this is why I have. On the contrary, you absolutely, when things are going south, point to things that a CMO is doing. And if they are bucking the trend, then you know that that was their work, right? And so this yeah. is where we're coming into the cats. Yeah. And, and look, one of the things that was so interesting in, in about the pandemic, in the first three months of it, every brand had to look and sort of define themselves and say, are we essential? And if, if we are essential, we can get back past what I call the CF no, right? But if you're not essential, the CF no is saying, uh-uh, not now, right? Because I've got emergencies going. So the exercise of going through and thinking about how do we make our business essential if we're not already was fascinating and important. And then the second thing was the CFO who would say yes uh, later in the thing, it was speed to value. So how quickly could you get to the point where um, your product or service would actually deliver value? Because again, in that first year, it was all about cash flow. They were just they were focused on that because nobody knew what was going on. I think 2021 was a very different year for just about everybody, but 2020 was very much about are you in that sweet spot? And so a lot of businesses obviously succeeded simply because they were a set. I mean, like Zoom, just right, uh, yeah. and others. But uh, I saw another number of examples of businesses that figured out how to help themselves think about being essential and having that speed to value. That was part one. Part two, which I think is just a biggest lesson, is what a lot of CMOs did that I admire right as the pandemic began, they got on the phone and called up every one of their customers that the CMO had a relationship with and said, how can we help you? How are things going? What's going on? And what they learned in that process is uh, general client satisfaction, underutilization of the product that they already had, upsell and cross-sell opportunities. So suddenly, and this is again, a very important part of the book is customer centricity and thinking about your customer as a primary target as opposed to a secondary target, right? It's like, that's what the book really does well. It flips the targets on its, on its end, it says, right? Yeah, and, very and now even more so. So anyway, I, I've gone on too long. You uh, uh, jump in, please save me. No, it's fine. I, the, the thing that I was gratified by was, yeah, let's make no mistake. The customer is still at the center of the story, but the CMO, you know, if we're going to boil it down to a person, but it could be, you know, a team, as long as they all have this ethos, you have to have these sorts of focus when uh, times like early 2020 presents itself so that you can pounce on those opportunities. And, you know, the pun's intentional because that's a cat metaphor, um, but cats for anyone wondering, stands for the character traits courageous, artful, thoughtful, and scientific. And so you you keep these, and this is like a thread that runs through the book, right? Where you're you, you're not um, being too prescriptive, but as you tell stories of CMOs that do things, you kind of remind us, okay, well, this is a CMO showing the thoughtful, or this is them showing the courageous, right? Yeah, and there's a there's very much of a important structure in the, in the cats. I uh, uh, I am I mean I I like cats as 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 much as any other uh, uh, cat fan. Uh, but the the uh, the cool cats nail it on all four, and that actually came out of my first book because in the first book, which is the CMO's periodic table, I basically say there are 64 elements that every CMO needs to master. Here are those elements. They're divided into sort of a, really kind of you know, basics all the way to advanced. And 
at the end of it, uh, folks were saying, so Drew, um, 64, you know, can you boil it down? And as I boiled it down and developed a keynote around that first book, it was cats. It was, they were courageous, artful, thoughtful, and scientific for this book. I expanded it more and courageous became about strategy because what I was seeing in the marketplace and the reason I felt I needed to write this book was B2B marketing was getting ridiculously complicated, but not more effective. People were focused on tactics and not on strategy, and you were th seeing fewer and fewer brands be distinctive. So I, th I thought there's a lack of courage out there. And so if you take courageous strategy and they say, you got to clear away the clutter, you got to dare to be distinct, and you got to pounce on your purpose, those three things, those three steps, it's hard to go through those three steps and not come away with something that will help differentiate your brand from a strategic standpoint. And I know that sounds for any marketer so basic, but if we could go to any category together and we got on the web and we went at cybersecurity in one specific aspect, we would see the same color, the same web structure. We would yeah. see the same promise. And, and if we were lucky, we would see a promise. Most likely we would see 10 features, right? And we would get right down to speeds and feeds. And so the problem with that is <laughs> that you know, we're dealing with buying committees, we're dealing with all sorts of different folks. And if you don't have a distinctive positioning that can be summarized in eight words or less, and that you stick to it and deliver over and over and over again, you are going to have a buying committee that get the CFO gets one message. Oh, it's about ROI. And the security guy, the CISO gets a message. Oh, it's about security. And then the CMO gets a message. Oh, it's about why. They all see a different product. They get in together. Guess what? They don't actually buy. Yeah, great point. And, and so it just breaks down. So you know, the, I I would say full stop. If you if you can't get the courageous strategy part down, you know, you probably shouldn't be a CMO. Yeah, that might not be the right line of work. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, it's, go ahead. And, and what I appreciate about it is that the change really starts from within, as hokey as that sounds. Um, if if you aren't willing to take those, you know, four traits and internalize them, um, you may not be the right partner to get down in the trenches with your client base, with your industry targets. Uh, they, they need to know that you're going to do these things from them because some of them are pretty, you know, I, I would say maybe uh, it's not that they're unconventional. It, sometimes you return back to some core values. You talk about how brands are uh, a, a, a thing that you must, you know, treat as an asset because it will uh, outlast any features that you're coming out with this month. Right. Yeah. You have to yeah. do those things. Another one that you're kind of a little contrarian on is the amount of tech. Uh, and, you know, so let's talk about how much MarTech is in a company stack and how the book says a CMO should look at that and what they should choose to spend their focus on. Yeah. So uh, let's build it a little bit. Give me one second to sort of get, we go from strategy. We got to have that, right? And then the next part, we start to think about ideation and, and building your thing. And, and the, you made the point, and I want to just emphasize it. Marketing is a team sport. You've got to build your team. You've got to build your departments. And, and I talk about in a very prescriptive way, the relationships that CMOs need to build and how and why they're so important with the head of sales, the head of HR and the CFO. Because yeah. when we get to the metrics part of it and, and all of that, the CFO needs to be really involved. So that's why I didn't want to jump because you have to build those relationships right away. Um, and then we have to get to this sort of notion of we have to be able to articulate our brand incredibly Simply, and I, you were mentioning this uh, notion of of how the values of a brand and so forth. And I just want to share, you know, I talk about this brand case paper, and case paper yeah. is a family owned business. They've been in business close to eighty years. You know, I mean, it's paper. They're paper merchants. There's nothing sexy about them. But this is a, a business that one has always had a sense of humor. Um, this is a 
company that deeply believes in in customer centricity and customer first. And so this was actually a client of ours, uh, and we wrote the line um, case paper on the case. And we actually heretically you talk about sort of a dare to be distinctive. We took the words on the and slapped them on top of the logo. Like nobody ever puts a tagline on a logo. No, not, well, that's that's, that's heresy. Not, that's heresy. You can't do that. So we did that, and and had a lot of fun with the on the. So you literally had a pun built into their logo visually and verbally, and that's the brand. It sets up. This is a brand with a sense of humor. This is a brand you're going to enjoy working about. And then underneath on the case was, it's not just about being responsive. It's about being reliable and resourceful. So I gave you six words. You're on the case, you're reliable, you're responsive, and you're resourceful. And I can tell you that every single employee at Case Paper, there's over 400, knows on the case. They know that because they're the on the case awards. Um, for both employees and for customers. Um, and they know that the rewards are based on these principles of reliable, responsive, and resourceful, and that they can have fun. So all those things are really important because we can then move on to execution and we can talk about engaging employees first. So I talked about that True. on the case. Spent He spent, uh, Simon uh, Schaefer, uh, spent six months Retraining employees on what it meant to be on the case, talking about that and measuring that and getting them excited about the on the case awards and developing this program. So there was a level that they could then go to and talk to it about with customers. And then from customers, they expanded it beyond. So, and then again, that's, a, that's an aspect of courage there to make sure that you've forged those ties with your colleagues in other departments and that you, once the brand has been, you know, boiled down to that essence, that you're willing to go in all directions. You're willing to go to the person who's on the loading dock, to the person who's in the office, to the person who's, you know, closing the deal with them. All of them have to be part of that. Exactly. And they, and this is, it's, it's, you know, radically simplifying what could be a radically, you know, what which could be ridiculously complicated, right? Because they could have a multi-part demand generation thing with digital this and digital that and all these cool elements saying completely customized different things to everybody. Instead, it's a brand with a really clear, humorous personality that comes through in their social media, it comes through in their correspondence, it comes through in their awards, it comes through in the way the employees talk to their customers. And so, I, and I talk about that a lot. I'm so glad you brought about, so if you are a courageous CMO, you're saying, you know what, I'm not going to just change the message. I'm going to change the business. That's what real courage is. And you don't change the business with a with a business strategy unless employees are retrained. I have another example in the book uh, from Aetna, and I and I love this story because they had this line: "You don't join us, we join you." As a yeah. which is a kind of a it's an interesting tagline, but it doesn't like make you go. It doesn't make you think very much um, necessarily. But the way they made it real was six months of training. Six months of training of employee training so that when you call and let's say you have to get approval for uh, a knee surgery, for example, they got retrained so that if you call, they'll say, uh, oh, you know what? People who usually get knee surgery also want PT. Can I give you a list of PT people? Well, you know, imagine calling your insurance company and them actually being helpful like that. And so it also had some strategic aspects of one of the things they needed to know was know their customer. So all, you know, when marketing is terrible, it's when it's a veneer. When it, marketing is amazing is when it's real and it's built into the fabric of the business and it transforms the business. And that's why I feel like this profession is incredible when it's, when that CMO has the courage and the CEO behind them will support them. Uh, and so the opportunity to transform and marketing yeah. can do that. Uh, so anyway, we can finally get to this last part before we get to, to metrics and so forth is the last part of what it, where I see marketing is disastrous is everybody says, oh, we got to get more content. We got a content calendar and we have 30 days and we have six channels and we got to get content out there. And 
most of them, not a single employee would want to read, let alone a customer. And yeah. so it's garbage. And the, the truth is the world doesn't need, it's pollution. And so one of the things we talk about in the book is less better. <laughs> you know, if you're going to do those, think about that blog post that I put in the mother of a blog post, 15,000 words. Well, that thing gets 200 to 400 visitors a day right. because on that piece alone, just because it's such a robust piece, you could write of well, 15,000, that's 3,500 word blog posts and never get a single click into your website. And you, I'm sure, were tempted to go down into those distractions and write all those little ones, but it takes a lot of work to say no to it does. those many things and to the metrics that will suffer accordingly right to to have something that is truly emblemizing the brand right right so that's that's what we mean by that uh, maybe, maybe just another one that the cmo i think has to um and this is you know maybe we could call this our putting our big boy and our big girl pants on <laughs> is you say courageous marketers are business strategists first so if we do want to as you say have the ceo behind us supporting us and the cfo supporting us we have to be willing to understand the model that we're fitting into. We have to be able to have the literacy with the spreadsheets to know what the drivers are and to be able to speak to them in their language. Yeah, it's exactly right. And then that's, uh, I spent a fair amount of time in, in chapter 10 on measuring what matters, talking about that, because there is a disconnect between typically marketing metrics and what a CFO and a board of directors and VCs and PE firms sort of it's, recognize. It's terrible. It's, it's almost the, okay, now the CMO is standing up. Everybody can, you know, <laughs> close their eyelids for a few minutes and then we'll get back to talking about business. Yeah, it's um, it's unfortunate, and but I've I know a number of CMOS who've who've solved that problem. Uh, often they present with the salesperson together, uh, you know, and and so that that's part one. Two, when it when it comes to metrics, you know, you've got to work with the CFO, who's you know most of the time the CFO or the CEO are approving the budget, and you have to get the CFO to say. We spend this budget in this way, measuring it this thing, and we achieve these goals. Are you behind us? Yeah. Right? Because, you know, the, the, an enlightened CFO, and, we've, and they, this will allow me to talk about uh, CMO huddles a little bit, but um, an enlightened CFO will say, marketing is a lever that I can pull to grow the business. It's a place I can invest. An unenlightened CFO only sees marketing as an expense. Right. Right. And there are enlightened CFOs out there. I've talked to them and, and, and they're amazing because they've worked with CMOs who've educated them that to get there and they've worked on it together and worked on metrics that the CFO can go, oh, okay. And it's not just direct response metrics. I mean, you can create, and this is part of, uh, in the book, I talk about these blended metrics for uh, employees. Because right yeah. now, almost every company is in an employee war. And again, I wasn't sure where that was going to go. And that's one of the reasons why I was glad I put the book on hold for six months, because we could have right. gone really deep and it, there could have been a lot of people out of work. And uh, instead, in white collar businesses, there's a shortage of workers on an extreme level. And yes. so brand really matters. And that printing company I mentioned, they are able to recruit because they have a sense of humor, even in their employee recruitment ads, yeah. uh, which is amazing. So uh, you go to the CFO and say, here's where marketing should be measured. Employees, customer retention and satisfaction, and our ability to drive prospects into the pipeline. Okay. So I've given you a three, there's probably a fourth, which is brand, which is this sort of broader thing and the hardest one to get. So you have yeah, four but you, those, you make sure that it, it stays somewhere in the mix, right? Yeah. And so you have those four employees, customers, prospects, and brand. 
And you put two metrics underneath those. So now you have at most eight. And a couple of those, I cheat a little bit because they're blended metrics. But I'm not really cheating. I'm giving you an opportunity. If you want to measure awareness, you can create sort of a, a cheap way of doing it as opposed to a tracking study by creating these blended metrics. But if you go to a CFO and say, this is what we're spending, and it's going to impact employees, retention numbers, and advocacy numbers, it's going to attack customer retention numbers and advocacy numbers, and it's going to impact pipeline, it's pretty hard to sort of say, oh, I don't want to spend that money. That's a cost, right? But you then work on those uh, metrics with uh, with your CFO. Again, this is like this is why marketing is not an island. You you have a, all these dependencies. You know you've got a dependency on sales. You've got a dependency on product. You've got, uh, but you know you need the CFO to be your best friend. You need to be able to walk hand in hand with them. Yeah. Uh, now let's put this on its head for a bit. Let's imagine that you know I'm looking at taking a new job as a head of marketing in a company, and right. I'm listening to Glenn and Drew talk, and I'm being a bit cynical. Um, you kind of caught my attention, at least when you collared me and said that talk about those metrics, the importance of that could actually have begun before you even set foot in your new job. Yes. T tell me why. Well, look, there are uh, less than 20% of CEOs spend any time in marketing. Less than 20%. Some say it's about 5%. I've seen reports anywhere. So that means there's an 80% chance that the person you are that's going to hire you has never actually worked in marketing. So their yeah. understanding of marketing, they think they understand. It's all derivative. It. It's yeah. all derivative. They've never actually come up uh, through that. Uh, and, and that's unfortunate because it means they don't know the, how to ask the right questions. They don't know how the pieces add up. They don't necessarily know what metrics matter and how the metrics contribute, You know how marketing contributes to employees, customers, prospects, and brand. They don't, they don't get how necessarily how that goes. And so what a CMO has to go in in is they have to go in and set expectations together. And so it's a two-part. You could just say to the CEO, what does success look like, right? Why did the last, why, you know, why did the last guy get canned in a year or gal get canned in a year? But probably better off you start with one is what are your expectations for what? Right? Yep. And but number two is here's my set of this is what I believe that marketing can do with employees, customers, and so forth. And if we achieve that, will you be happy? Right? Yeah. And, and let's, let's even like, since the proactiveness is now coming from that head of marketing, you know, let's take it a tiny step further. Let's not forget that Sure. So most of those CEOs have not set foot in marketing. Uh, this is even, you know, there's a distribution by industry. Um, if you look at consumer packaged goods, it's probably way higher that they've been yep. in marketing. But, you know, the listeners of this show are largely in the B2B and in technical fields. So way below 20%. I'm, I'm kind of guessing that <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. they're, at the, they're at the lowest end. Now, that's important. Not because you should be shaking in your boots as you walk in, but think about how much more you know than they do about what could be done to transform and make them a category leader and make them be the employer of desire for you know all recruitment, make them uh, considered a valued member of their community, their local community. Right. We, we, we have to remember what we know. We're so quick to discount it, aren't we? Right. Right. You know, it's I, I you know, I talk about uh, this in the book and uh, a lot is I have tremendous empathy for the CMO uh, because of the challenges. You know, like I've talked to hundreds of them. And then over the last uh, 18 months, that number has increased dramatically because of CMO huddles. 
And well, well okay, and and to get to the huddles, let's first talk about a chapter that you have in there called selling through service. Yes. So give us that concept and then tell us how CMO huddles emblemizes it. Yeah, so the the notion of selling through service is that none of us want to be sold to. And marketing, you know, most marketing and content I've already sort of is just we'll call it pollution for lack of a better word. It's just yep. buy my product. Here's why all the reasons, here's three good reasons why you should buy my product today. Um whereas what selling through service basically says is you um I know that, uh, Glenn, you have a podcast and uh, you need really, really good guests for your podcast. Here are five shows that uh, are guests that I think you you should have uh, on, on it, right? Hang on. Let me write this down. Right. I've got your attention, right? Yeah. I've done something of value for you in this conversation. That's It's a value exchange. And so selling through service essentially says there is something that you can do of value for every single customer that you have, right? And we've, and we've, we've left almost to the point where it's, it's on the threshold of the door out of the room, (laughs) what it is that I have to sell you, right? Yeah. It's there, but, but it's way off to the side. Yeah. But I mean, and it's not, it's not irrelevant completely to that thing. So I mean, you know, selling through service could be, hey, Drew has a podcast called Renegade Marketers Unite. I've produced 280 episodes of that show. That is me interviewing CMOs from around the world who was uh, really interesting marketers. That's a service. Am I selling Renegade? Kind of. Kind of, but not really. It's a service. It's, it is that is of genuine value. And right. you know, obviously it falls into a lots of categories. So yes. And happened, now let's, let's just remember that. So as of March, 2020, <laughs> the, the, you know, yes, there's a, a podcast by Drew. There's um, events that CMOs had been able to get to. There are uh target audiences by their industry. Maybe they, you know, all head down to the, to the bar when, you know, their industry confab happens. And then as of March, 2020, almost all that gone. Boom, boom. And so I have learned having been through several crises for renegade in various forms, uh, over the last 30 years, uh, I have sort of now a, sort of survival plan. I go into survival mode and survival mode starts with who can I help? Not, and just with the notion that if I throw some life preservers out there, maybe it will save me along with it. And so, uh, and it happened also that my good friend, Pete Kranick of the CMO club on March 2nd, 2020 had sold the CMO club to Salesforce. So that was uh, a whole nother thing. So he was in good shape. And I looked at my uh, sort of at March 17th or 14th, whenever the shutdown happened. And I just said, I don't know what's going to happen to Renegade's business. I don't know what's going to happen to all the CMOs out there and their businesses, but I do know that collectively, if we get together, we can at least help each other. And so I started huddling uh, as just a concept, April 1st, uh, 2020, we had about seven of us. Between April 1st and October uh, 1st, we had we huddled 55 times. Wow. With a variety of folks, the need was so great to be able to talk with peers, share challenges, share the pain of dealing yeah. with all the things that they had to deal with. So by uh, midsummer, it was clear there's a business here. We turned it into a, bi- a subscription service in October. Um, sure. We are just about to hit 100 subscribers. Uh, and it's, an, uh, it's just an amazing group of CMOs. And it's incredibly gratifying. And it all started with this notion of selling through service. I didn't know yeah. there was a business there. I just thought, let's see how can I how can I help? What can I do of value right now that in some ways it was uniquely able to do, yes. um, and, and take advantage of that and and let's see where it goes. And it's gone in a really nice direction. And it seems that that holds true to living the brand. Um, I think the other thing that I would note from what you said about it was that it reaches at a human level, right? So again, 
you have to be authentic with these things. The example I'm thinking of is some of the people in your huddles found out shortly after the shutdown that they were out of a job. You didn't boot them out of the huddle. Okay, so they were clearly more important to you than the fact that they could have a say at the purchase table, you know, for for a company here. They don't even have a company anymore. And you're passing their name around and, and seeing who can get them their next gig. Yeah, we actually created something. We still have it called the transition team. And that uh, is for CMOs that are between opportunities. There's no charge for that. We meet once a month. And uh, the other thing that we have for CMO models is we have a Slack channel. And one of the channels is CMO jobs. And we encourage those that, because if you have a CMO job, chances are you've heard about 10 in the last month now. And so they post and yeah. share those on the Slack channel channel and the transition team has seen it and a couple of them gotten jobs that way which is really gratifying uh so yeah so uh look i mean everybody every cmo is going to lose their job at one point or another and uh, uh it's nice to be able to help them and i always learn a lot and and the other huddles i learn from them uh and they feel better about knowing others that are in their same situation mm -hmm. for sure Swinging back around just towards it, you talk at the end about pulling it together and, you know, maybe making sure that you're doing all the things that you need to. If we're if we're living our brand and we're making sure that our brand is getting out there, you talk about how we can use brand health as a proxy for other things. And I think this is an important point because, uh, look, we we are all asked by higher ups to produce more leads and th that normally makes us lean towards direct response and to lean towards all of the activities that will fill pipeline right now. But you point out that, you know, we need to, even if that is what we have to do right now, we can't completely lose sight of brand initiatives and that, in fact, the data that we could get from those might even inform what we're doing on the lead gen side. Tell me about that. Yeah. So there, there's a, it's a, a couple things going on there in the measuring what matters chapter is um, it is really hard to separate brand and demand. And it is done every day. It's like the CFO says, I only want to spend money on things that are going to drive demand. Well, Right now, first of all, I want to argue with that completely in this sense. Uh, you know, what the heck is a lead today? Let's not even call it a lead. Let's call it an opportunity. You got a, you're got B2B. You got a 12-month sales cycle and 10 to 15 people involved. Where yes. does marketing stop? Wait, if you say it's just about pipeline and I just got to create an opportunity and you're done, you're wasting marketing's ability to nurture Sales guys aren't going to nurture that well. Marketing's got to come up with that meaningful content, that useful content that will help. They've got to do all the sales enablement work, right? And yes. and so first and is that brand, is that sales, is that marketing? Who cares? But the the, the point of this is we got to get from opportunity to the close and then we got to keep that customer and then we got to turn them into advocates. These are all things that marketing can have a huge impact on. That's the, that's so that point is hugely important, and it really breaks a paradigm that I think is way overused. And it is when people hear the word brand, they think top of funnel. And right. you've just illustrated there that no, all the way through the funnel and beyond the sale, the the need for brand continues. Um, and I guess we'll borrow from uh, a book you mentioned in glowing terms. Uh, I think it's the Challenger customer. Yeah. Right. right. So, and, and it, it really does pair nicely with your book. Uh, but you point out that, you know, there are vendor competitions happening and there are committees internally that are trying to decide who's going to be on those short lists. Well, brand may have had something to do with getting on the long list. But as you say, why stop there? Where is brand when it comes to people having something on the tip of their tongue to say about your company 
in one of those shortlisting meetings or in the final purchase negotiations or even after in the customer advocacy phase. Right. Yeah. I I mean, there's so much focus on closing deal, 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 deal. I get it. You've got investors and everything at this. But here's what the way I look at it is I'm looking at the, you know, sort of the cost, it's not cost per acquisition, it's cost per acquiring a happy customer, right? Mm-hmm. If you want to do a cost cost per acquisition, because, and, and I don't talk about too much in the book because it's almost impossible to calculate because it's just too long a, a, a number, but this is the thing that we're really looking for, right? Because it's lifetime value and we want happy customers because as a marketer, what do we need more than anything? We need testimonials. We need case studies. We need customer advocacy. We need referrals, all of those things, right? And so if you uh, have a brand and you build that brand and you tell a consistent story, the chances are at the end of this program, and this is a fascinating thing that Brent talks about, most of the time in these long sales cycle, everybody's unhappy at the end. <laughs> yeah. And so if you can be the guys that I like them, I trust them, they were consistent all the way through their brand. There was no bait and switch. I, I had a, uh, an executive was assigned to the, the sales process from the beginning and there was all the way through, it was such a clear thing that this was a company that has its act together. Yes. And consistency is one of the ways you show that, right? You're you're saying that might beat out a singular feed and speed that the competitor Every has. Every single time. Um, and so, and it's not just me saying that. I mean, Adamson's research from, from Gartner proves it, uh, that an inconsistent brand is 2.2 times less likely to win. So, you know, you needed brand to get on the list and you need brand to close. And so, again, I don't know how you separate these two. Um, I try, uh, even though they are separated on the budget, we know inherently uh, they are. So it's funny in huddles, it comes up a lot where we talk about, well, let's not call it brand. Let's use the euphemism. Let's just call it all revenue marketing. (laughs) You know, and yeah. we don't even use the word because it's uh, in, in, anyway. That's a silliness. Now, you asked a question earlier that I really never answered, which I talk about in the book, which is the uh, overspending on Martech. And yeah. uh, I, I don't. So I have seen this now where small companies have 10, 15, 20 different marketing technologies, and they're spending more than 10% of their marketing budget on technology. And MarTech isn't marketing. (laughs) And for every single technology that you acquire, most of the time you need a full-time, sometimes two headcounts to take advantage of that technology. So, and I can tell you that if you have 20 different individual technologies, there might be a few, and CMOs will argue with me on this one, might be a few technologies that will actually save you time. But most yeah. of them require time. And so I guarantee you, you, you bought 10 technologies, do you have 20 staff? No. Right. So right. what happens is you underutilize each of the pieces and you're not Sure, because getting- your pacing item is the number of bodies you have. Yeah. And if you didn't budget for additional bodies when you got the new tech, then you've kind of shot yourself in the foot. Yeah. So in the book, I talk about doing a marketing, a MarTech audit, describe the process, makes it easy. And one of the things I didn't mention, but it came up in a huddle, uh, which I think is just brilliant, is whoever is, there has to be a champion for every technology that you have in your department. Right. And if there isn't, right. uh, that's why a problem. Why is it there? Yeah. yeah why is or, it there? Or I would say if it doesn't fold into one of those eight metrics right. that you're using at the top... Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I think, and that's a place where it's like, oh, I'm spending 15% of MarTech. That's not marketing. That's money. You take that 5%, you put that back into something that would actually either build awareness or help drive demand, you know, either one or both. Uh, yeah. And, so and we're n- Neither of us are panning, you know, these no. wonderful technologies, um, but bringing it back to the cats, you know, if that's the scientific side of marketing, yep. uh, you also include the artful side. So we just have to make sure that they're in balance. Exactly. 
Exactly. And then I think, but the most important part, and this is why I, I like, like, if you're not a marketer, those last three uh, chapters in my book can get grind you down a little bit because they're very specific on measurement and technology. But the way it ends with Test to Triumph, I think is really important to the book and the spirit of the book, which is there's marketing is incredible in that there's always new things you can try. Yeah. And so the book says spend at least 10%, if not 20% of your budget on experiments. This will, yep. like your, your yep. team will get excited because they get to experiment and it could save your bacon because I, I, I think it's, I think it actually even goes farther. I think it l can um, lead to a transformation that spreads throughout into your sales team. You talk about how those experiments will cause you to have to grasp what the single source of truth is. So the data team that, you know, comes out of the woodwork, people who had been sitting with their own reports and the fact that they'll have to work together to be able to defensively say this experiment made sales go up. You are, you are providing great value inside the organization. That's probably Right now, people think it's sitting outside of marketing, and you as a marketer are way better placed than all of those, and they will welcome you taking that over if you yep. step up. Yep. Yeah. And uh, one of the uh, one of the CMOs that I know, uh, I mentioned in, in the book, who is now a CEO, drove innovation weeks at his company. Uh, at Jeff Perkins at, at Park Mobile. And uh, anyway, so if you ever want to be a CEO, that's one path. <laughs> so I can't think of a better note to finish on. Uh, Drew, if people want to get the book and find out more about you, where th can they go? So uh, Amazon, in, uh, soon you'll be able to actually get the hardcover. We're, we're going to put that up for sale uh, on the uh, site. So uh, Amazon has hardcover, paperback, audio, um, even it, uh, the ebook. Uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn, uh, Drew Neiser, I'm uh, on LinkedIn, or you can go to renegade.com. And uh, uh, happy to do anything for any of your listeners. I really appreciate it. Well, I've gotten a ton of value out of this. I think that uh, it emboldens uh, people who are in marketing leadership positions or those that support them to, to read about this. And it, it gives me some new hope, uh, maybe new hope for a new year, but also for the, uh, the, the times that are ahead and how we can probably get down to these fundamentals that will make long-term value for the companies that we're in and even wider communities. Um, listener, if you like what Drew has said today and what you've heard, please go ahead and share this episode with somebody who would perhaps benefit from it. And I hope that one thing that he has said has helped you make your funnel even better. Glenn, thank you so much for what you're doing. I hope your listeners appreciate how much work it is to do a podcast like this. Uh, uh, kudos to you and, and thank you for having me. Thanks, Drew. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.